Hello, everybody. This is Gregory with 5-Minute Catholic Apologetics, where five minutes of your time may get you to the divine. Today, we're going to go back down the road of history to talk about the Cristero War. Now, before we begin, let's start with a prayer. Nomina Patris et Filii et Spiritui Sancti. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Sucutura in principio et nuc et semper et seculae seculorum. Amen. I'm going to put in some banners for other historical treatments I've done. You know, I'm a lover of history. My degrees are in history. So I do have an episode on the real truth about the Crusades, the real truth about the Inquisition. So, and then we have one on the French Revolution as well. So I wanted to do one on, on the Cristiada or the Cristero Wars, the Christ Wars that happened in Mexico for a couple of reasons. One is that this is very close to my heart because my family, I'm, I'm Mexican. My parents were born in Mexico. If you go to the episode on Gregory 101, I mentioned that. And my, my great-grandfather fought in the Cristero War. The Cristero War was mostly in Jalisco, which is the, the province kind of uh, on the Pacific side. Guadalajara is the, is the capital. So we were involved. My family was involved. Of course, this is way before my time. So a little backdrop here. So the Cristero War happened in a period of tumult in Mexico. So if you look, most of you guys know that, that uh, Mexico was colonized by Spain and brought uh, the Catholic religion and, and the Spanish language, of course. And during the colonial period, it was a, a time where, where Catholicism thrived. I mean, you have Sor Juana la Cruz, you have some saints that came out during that period. But in the, in the mid-19th century, after, after Mexico got its independence, uh, you saw this echoed out in Europe with the revolution of 1830, 1848, and the growing anti-clerical movement, anti-clerical meaning against the church movement. You see this played out, played out in the culture comp in Germany later in the 19th century, and certainly in France in the Third Republic. But in, in, in Mexico, under Benito Juarez, who was a liberal, there was a lot of uh, anti-clerical movement. And then what happened was Diaz was this big dictator who ruled Mexico for 35 years up until 1910, and he was, you know, he was part of the, I guess you could pit, like it was, it's kind of like in the French Revolution. On one side, you had the conservative faction, which was like monarchy or the wealthy and the church versus the, the, the bourgeois and the, 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 the crypto proto-socialists and those wanting land reform, let's say, on the other side. So this kind of all culminated in the Mexican Revolution. And we're just going to speed through all this really fast which took 10 years. Eventually, you had different factions in it. Carranza was the guy who eventually kind of won, and he wrote the Constitution of 1917. The Constitution of 1917 would be perceived now and then as, as a very uh, socialist constitution. And in it, there were some articles that limited the power of the church. Now, we know that a lot of people will say that the church needed to be quelled because the church owned a lot of property. And the church uh, was teaching, of course, Catholicism. Now, most people wouldn't think that's a problem, but you have to understand in this milieu that a lot of the leadership um, were anti-Catholic, anti-Christian, and, and Freemasonic. And we've talked about this in the French Revolution. And you see that, we're in, certainly you saw it in the Spanish Civil War about 10 years later, that anytime there's a revolution, and there's radical left forces involved. Uh, there's going to be a lot of killing of Catholics. That's just the way. That's just the way it is. So, in the Constitution, 1917, um, there are there were articles in it that really restricted the Catholic Church. So, for example, Catholic the the priests the, the government could determine how many priests were in each state in Mexico to determine the allotment, and it forbade Catholic priests from wearing their garb in, in public and in other restrictions. But they really weren't enforced until Obregón and Calles came in. So Calles was uh, the, the president of Mexico right after the revolution, like early 1920s. And then Obregón was kind of his henchman successor. They were both Masons. And going back to Benito Juarez, if you know the story of Maximilian, the, the Archduke of Austria, who became Emperor of Mexico for a while, they captured him and they were going to spare his life. But Juarez was a Mason and said, no, we're going to kill him because uh, Maximilian was a, a supporter of the Catholic Church and was a Catholic. 
So when Kayes came in, he started to implement some of these radical things in the Constitution, Article 130, and then he, he imposed more and more and more. Like he was at the point where they were going to prohibit the Catholic Mass and so forth. And so the people had it. Not all people, you know, understand like it is today, the more wealthy people were nominally practicing religious people, but they were kind of like more practicing to mammon. But either way, there were armed insurrections they started in 1926 and full out started in 1927. So the Cristero War essentially ran from 1926 to 1929. So on one side, you had the Spanish government, the full force of the Spanish government. Uh, on the other side, you had essentially, <laughs> I mean, peasants, men and women with no military training. There were female uh, military units. And then you had you had some of the middle class that were very supportive of the Christian. These are going to be the real, the hardcore Catholics, and that's pretty much who you had. Now you had some retired generals that came and supported the Cristeros and tried to, you know, create an actual, you know, military unit that could compete against the Mexican military. And in the beginning, the Cristeros did have some success in 1927, but ultimately, you know, kind of like the the the, the South and the Civil War. You have a preponderance of money, you have preponderance of, of just military expertise on one side, it's eventually gonna win out. Now the American government was getting involved, good old America, there, there's a saying, I think Diaz had this saying, it's like Mexico, so, so close to God, or was it so far from God, too close to the United States. So the United States was always getting involved, it got involved in the, in the, in the Mexican uh, revolution as well, but the Mexican or the American government was actually giving money to the Freemasonic Calles Mexican government to help quell the rebellion. And Pius XI, who was pope during this time, wrote many encyclicals condemning the Mexican government's uh, persecution of the Catholic faith and killing all these Catholic lay people and sacrileging. Uh, churches and raping nuns and killing priests and all these things and the Mexican government would give lip service but again they were you know run and led by vehemently anti-catholic and anti-christian leadership so you know they gave lip service but they really didn't care but eventually the American government served as a mediator and by 1929 uh, the Cristero War was essentially over uh, the the Mexican government decided, you know, this is a bad PR thing and bad optics. And even though they were winning in terms of a military war, uh, they realized that this was not a good idea. And so the, the articles, like Article 130, never really went away. It's just the Mexican government never after uh, the 1930s, like when Cardenas and other people came into power, never enacted it. So they just kind of let, let it go and they allowed the church uh, to practice again, they weren't confiscating church property. Confiscating church property, of course, goes back. To, I mean, Luther. I mean, you, you, we we need to do a treatment on on the the German uh, kind of rebellion of 1517, 1530, because a lot of that was just using religious excuses really for political gains, and and you saw this played out with Henry VIII later in the English Reformation. And a lot of it was just to get money. It was just to get church land to get the monasteries, to get all this money and land and, and trinkets and get it into the treasury of the government. But by 1929, the, the, the government backed down and essentially things went back to normal. I would tell you this, uh, there are some great saints and martyrs that came out of the Cristero, probably Father Miguel Pro, is probably the most famous one. He yelled out, Vivo Cristo Rey, before they had a martyr by a firing squad. Pope John Paul II uh, canonized about 25, 26 of these, of these uh, Mexican Cristero fighters. And the reason they're called Cristero fighters is because they would always yell out, Vivo Cristo Rey, and, and they had a lot of Catholic imagery. And so Father Miguel Pro is probably the most famous of those saints. But this is like an episode in, uh, I would say American history that most Americans don't know. I would say most Catholics don't know it. And it was, it was sad because the, the, Chris, the Cristeros, the movement's called the Cristiada, essentially, but the, the Cristeros were sold out in a lot of ways because the Mexican wealthy abandoned them, right? Didn't want to have anything to do with them. And you could say it's only because they didn't want to support rebellion. But remember, Mexico was 100% Catholic at this time. So the Mexican wealthy uh, abandoned them. Most of the bishops in Mexico did not support the rebellion because, again, mammon, you know, when you... 
and you could say maybe played out even today in 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 the in in, in Rome today. You know, when when you have so much money, when you have so much power, um, you turn a blind eye to when the church is getting persecuted because you're not getting persecuted. You're benefiting from it somehow because you're still in cohort cohort cohorts and collusion with the ruling elite. So most of the bishops just didn't support the Cristeros, didn't support, and they were abetting and allowing the persecution and killing of Catholics. And all the Catholics wanted was their mass. You know, they, they, they just wanted all these things lifted and just let them practice their faith. But most of the bishops turned the black eye or turned, turned a an eye away from it. The Bishop of Guadalajara did support them as much as he could, but most of them didn't. Of course, the government was against them, the wealthy were against them, and uh, the Vatican was for them. But eventually, with the compromise in 1929, the Vatican backed down and said that they weren't going to support the the Cristeros. Because you have to understand the the concept of the just war and so forth. And at this point, uh, the Mexican government said, we're no longer going to persecute, we're going to allow things to go back. So the, the papacy no longer supported it and things essentially went back to normal. And that's essentially the Cristero. So in closing, just understand that when anti-clerical governments take power in places, they come after you. (laughs) I mean, they come after us. And there's examples of this, certainly like in Zimbabwe, in in Africa, and in Vietnam, before the Vietnam War, and then when Ho Chi Minh came in. You know, anytime there's a radical left government and they come into a country that's Catholic, um, they're gonna be killing people. And there's a lot of examples. You can certainly say this about the Orthodox and the Russian Revolution. I mean, it's, it's obvious the communists, one of their intended goals is to destroy Christianity, period. And that's the goal of the radical left, because they want you to worship the state. Right? They don't want you to worship something higher. So you learn from history. So you see the French Revolution, Spanish Civil War, the Cristero here, Russian Revolution. You see when governments like this are put into power, they come after you and me. And don't be deceived to think that this can never happen in the United States. This could happen. I would say that we're in soft persecution right now, but hard persecution will come if the government really shows its true cards. We get a, a truly radical left government and they can of course seize enough of the guns because that's one of the things that keeps the government from going after people is because we're still well armed. But guys, um, there is a movie for Greater Glory that came out in 2012. I never saw that movie, but if you want like a condensed, better treatment of this, go check out that movie if you can find it. Guys, post in the comments. Let me know if you know about the Cristeros, what you think about it, and uh, please hit the notification button and share with others. Until next time, take care, God bless, and pray.